Um, about 3,000 years ago, something very remarkable happened. Stonemasons who were building the burial tomb of King Ramses III in Egypt were not receiving the rations they'd been promised. Uh, they, were, they were hungry, they were angry, so they put down their tools and they marched the administration and demanded the food that they were owed. And the administrators actually had no idea how to respond and just gave them food to basically shut them up. And they had no idea to respond because that was actually, as far as we know, the first recorded instance of collective action by the direct producers against the 1% who control, control society. It was the first strike. And of course, in the centuries that followed, the rhythms of struggle grew. The symphony of struggle uh, uh, increased in its intensity. Sometimes it died away a little. Sometimes it got stronger. But the reality is, for the last 3,000 years, human beings have fought for their material needs, they fought for their, their dignity, and they fought for their rights, and they fought collectively. And so uh, we saw slave, slave revolts, first across the Roman Empire, later on against the uh, colonial empires. We saw peasant revolts convulse medieval Europe over and over again. Every few generations, people would rise up and burn the, the house of the, of the landlord. And inside that, there was a kernel of an idea that actually people were equal and we should have an equal and fair and just society. So in early, early medieval times in England, people came up with a little saying, when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? In the Garden of Eden, we were all naked and we were all equal. And why can't we be, if not naked, why can't we be, we be equal all over again? If you want to take your clothes off, don't, don't let me stop you, but I won't join you from this day. In other words, they didn't know how necessarily to achieve that equality, but there was a sense that the Lord who rode past, who took your food, that you had grown, was no better than you and should be, and, and should be resisted. And those ideas of resistance began to take on uh, a greater intellectual and organisational shape as we move into the epoch of capitalism and the beginnings of, uh, of, of greater collective classes. So in the 1640s, the diggers, the extreme left wing of the English Revolution, established communes, essentially communist communes, where people came, to, came together as free individuals, laboured to produce what was needed for the collective and shared it according, according to means. That experiment was crushed, but it was an experiment that was to echo on into the capitalist era. And you, you fast forward to 1871, and the artisans and workers of Paris seized control of the city of Paris. And for a few weeks, through democratic control and democratic control of, of force, through the, the creation of a people's militia, uh, they, they controlled the capital of one of the greatest uh, countries in the world. That too was crushed. The struggle falls back. But people learn, and people move forward. And the, the symphony of struggle reaches a crescendo in the year that we're talking about, 1917, 100 years ago. It reaches a crescendo where for the first time, not a village, not a commune, not a, a city, but an entire country is seized, the power is seized by the direct producers, by, in this case, the working class and by, uh, are supported, supported by the peasantry. And not an insignificant country, a country that occupies one sixth of the habitable service surface of, of the world, a country run by a barbaric um, uh, 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 royal family who basically, whose luxury life is, 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 um, is, uh, is gained over the bones of the, the poor and the oppressed. And that revolution was a remarkable point, an absolute high point in human history. It brought down the royal family. And as a result, the revolutions that it uh, helped uh, inspire brought down the royal families in Germany, in Austro-Hungary, uh, Austro and in Turkey. Entire empires fell as a result of the, uh, the, uh, the actions of 1917. Workers here in Sydney were inspired, uh, were partly inspired by the events in Russia to take part in the Great General Strike, um, which began here in the, in the railway works, and I know was celebrated. Um, only a, a couple of years, uh, a couple of uh, weeks, weeks ago, people around the world heard the news that tyranny and dictatorship could be overthrown by mass revolt, and they wanted to take part in it. The revolution of 1917 was a carnival of the oppressed. We say that casually. Uh, it's a saying you know, that comes from the Leninist tradition: a carnival of the oppressed. What did that look like? Well, Trotsky talks about the way that the domestic servants of the rich and powerful 
went out and partied. They went out and had a bloody good time and they come back in the evening and freshen up, ready to go back out again and the rich grumbled because only the rich were allowed to party all day and party all night. The domestic servants had no such right. But they took that right and they were far from the weakest, uh, far from the strongest section of the working class, but they felt a sense of liberation and freedom that they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have felt in any other way. And the workers and then the soldiers, the sailors and the, the peasants of Russia began to develop a brand new form of democratic control. Not a democracy where we vote every three years or four years or five years for an MP who then does whatever the hell they want to do in Parliament and comes back <coughs> and basically we submit to the whole process over and over again. Where miraculously we're only allowed to choose one question uh, outside of parliamentary control and that's the, uh, the, the dodgy plebiscite on whether uh, same-sex marriage is allowed. What a perversion of the concept of democracy. Where is the, the control of uh, our, our daily lives? When in Russia, directly elected delegates coming from the workplaces, the regiments, the ships, the peasants, came together and formed councils. The Russian word was Soviet. And those Soviets had direct control and a direct authority in a way that a parliament uh, can, can never have because it was born of the mass of people and uh, represented directly the views of the mass of people. <coughs> Marx and Engels wrote in the Communist Manifesto in 1848, when the working class was a tiny, tiny fringe on, uh, on the north, northern, uh, northern edge of Europe, they wrote that the working class would overthrow capitalism and it would be a movement of the immense majority in the, in the interests of the immense majority. And that is exactly what we saw in Russia in, uh, in 1917, especially after the Great Revolution uh, uh, in, in October. Workers took control of the workplace. They either kicked out the bosses who they hated, they tore up the rule books that oppressed them, or they controlled uh, the managers and said, you will only act when we give you permission to act. The peasants got the land. They didn't wait for the revolution, they just went out there and they took it. And as they got angrier and they got more confident, they didn't just take the land. They took the landlord's houses. They got their horses and carts and went down to the local noble's uh, you know, local palace and ripped it to pieces, piece by piece, and carried it away. Because that was the, the revenge that they were taking on behalf, not just of them and their children, but their parents and their grandparents and generations uh, un unremembered, but uh, uh, wor worthy, of, uh, worthy of revenge. The revolution was a celebration and <coughs> led by women uh, in the first instant and was a fantastic moment in the liberation of, of, of women. Women led the revolution on International Women's Day, which in the Russian calendar fell in late February, but it was the same International Women's Day that we celebrate today. They led the revolution, they galvanised the men behind them in Petrograd, St. Petersburg, the, the capital of Russia and the main industrial centre center of, uh, of Russia. Uh, and then uh, they went on uh, to organise, and the Bolsheviks organised a women's department, not to compartmentalise women, but to raise women up, to deal with the practical problems that women face. We talked about gender in the, in the session before, there is still a gendered role around childbearing and childrearing, and the Bolsheviks said, well, this doesn't have to be, beyond the point of birth, this doesn't have to be the individual responsibility of the woman. It's a social and collective responsibility. We want women workers to be free to participate in, in society. And a symbol of that progress was the fact that Alex Alexandra Kolontai joined the first Soviet government after uh, October 1917 as a government minister. I believe the first woman government minister anywhere in the world. All the restrictions on divorce, on abortion, were swept away. Restrictions on homosexuality were swept away. In 1918, Georgi Chicherin became the Commissar for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, an openly gay man. Uh, the restrictions on Jews were swept away, and there were 650 pieces of legislation restricting Jews in the, in, in the Russian Empire. And Trotsky, a Jew, became the leader of the Petrograd Soviet and the found, founder of the, the, the Red Army. National minorities, and they were more than 50% of the population inside the Russian Empire, uh, found their voice and found, and found their freedom. And yet, despite all of that, the critics of the Russian Revolution would have us believe that it was a vile plot, it was a coup carried out by manipulating Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, over the heads of a stupid, ignorant and brutish mass, that it was a perversion of, democ a perversion of democracy. And I hope that I'm going to demonstrate 
uh, in the next 20 odd minutes or so, that that's not the case. And in fact, for Marxists, we would argue that it was the highest point in human history to date. It's our past, but also our future, our inspiration. It, we know, because it's been done before, that ordinary people against all, apparently all odds, can rise up and take control of the state machine, smash it and build a new democratic society as part of a new democratic world. Now, I want to spend my time really talking about two key points. The first is that the revolution was a process. It wasn't, I think a lot of people are seeing Les Miserables. And in Les Miserables, it's just a lot of people either building barricades or running at barricades. And it all seems to be um, you know, fairly short and sharp. Um, you win, you lose, but at the end of the day, it's really just a bit of uh, street fighting. That's not the case at all. And you look at the Russian revolution, you can see it's a process. Why is it a process? I think it's a process first and foremost, and this sounds like a paradox, because revolutions are made by reformists. They're not made by conscious revolutionaries, like many of us in the room you know, would like to think of ourselves as being. The women who came out on International Women's Day in Petrograd uh, in, in uh, February 1917 did not come out to bring down the Tsar and then to bring down capitalism. Although many of them would have actually liked the idea if you'd asked them, they came out because they wanted bread. They came out because their families were hungry. They came out because their wages weren't enough to, to, uh, to buy food, food for their family. And they didn't know when they saw the Cossacks on horseback, and the Cossacks were the shock troops of the Tsarist Empire. They were the, the soldiers who were used to put down, to beat, to maim, and to kill people who rose up against the Empire. They didn't know when they saw the Cossack soldiers on horseback across the street that the Cossacks would let them go under the horses, that the Cossacks would give them the wink that it was okay to proceed. They didn't know that. And the Cossacks, when they gave them the wink and let them proceed and march on in larger and larger numbers with male workers coming out on strike to join the women, 200,000 industrial workers on strike the next day after International Women's Day, the Cossacks didn't know that in doing that they would bring down the Tsar, who they probably revered. Um, because what happened in a matter of five days is that this mighty empire fell to pieces because the soldiers would not repress the workers and the workers would not be repressed. Um, nonetheless, the consciousness that was in the heads of the workers and to some extent, and obviously the soldiers as well, the day before the revolution was still there largely the day after the revolution. I mean, if you said to them, okay, you've done phase one, now it's on to phase two, three, four, they'd go, hang on, we've done, it's just done a bloody good day's work. We've brought down an empire that's lasted for a few hundred years. We've shattered one of the uh, key, uh, key uh, powers uh, in international diplomacy and, and in the First World War. We've actually raised up and renewed the Soviets, which emerged in 1905 and then came again uh, very, very quickly, within days in, in February. We've created these Soviets who represent us. The leadership of the Soviets are socialists. This is, socialists in many cases who have spent time in Siberia and hard labour, haven't we done enough? Isn't this it? Isn't, there, isn't this going to give us peace? Isn't this going to give us bread? Isn't this going to give the peasants land? Aren't we there already? And of course the reality was that it wasn't quite that simple. Um, nonetheless, the Soviets were in, held a power, a power in parallel to the official government, which was called the provisional government, which was basically a bunch of capitalists and landlords who ran together and said, oh shit, the Tsar's gone, we better establish something, because if we don't do it, the poor and the oppressed might actually fill, fill the vacuum. And, and there, were, there were two powers. There's the official power, which was basically the power of capitalism and, and, the, uh, and the landed aristocracy, many of whom would love to bring back the Tsar. And then there was the power of the, uh, of the Soviets. And the war minister said on 9th of March, and this is only a well, week and a half after International Women's Day, the government of us has no real power. The troops, the railroads, the port and telegraph are in the hands of the Soviet. The simple fact is that the provisional government exists only so long as the Soviets permit it. But the Soviets did permit it. And that is really the conundrum of, uh, of 19, uh, 1917. The poor and the oppressed knew what they wanted, but they didn't know how to achieve it. Have you ever bought a wardrobe from Ikea? Taken it up <laughs> and gone, 
yeah, I know how to put this together. Yeah, it's easy. You swap that bit in there, that bit in there, and oh yeah, that bit appears to go in there. And instructions, nah, nah, she'll be right, mate. Don't need the instructions. And the Bolsheviks were like the, the flatmate going, hang on, the instructions, the instructions. <laughs> and the mass of the workers and the peasants were going, nah, she'll be right, mate. We, we know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. We want a wardrobe. We know what a wardrobe looks like. We're just going to make a wardrobe. <laughs> Unfortunately, hands up who's tried making an IKEA flat pack wardrobe without the instructions. It's not that easy. So why did the dual power per persist? It wasn't just IKEA. It was because, to some extent, the socialists themselves had to take some responsibility for it. The socialists were organised primarily through the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party, and nobody remembers the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party, because it had long before split into two factions, the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. The Mensheviks are the bad guys, and the Bolsheviks are the good guys, in case you just want to sort of speed up the process. <laughs> the Bolsheviks were led by Lenin. But actually they had a lot in common. They had a lot in common. And one of the things they had in common was a belief that actually you couldn't expect the revolution in Russia to get, go beyond the, uh, the, 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 li the limits of um, establishing a capitalist society with a democracy. And of course, workers should get the eight-hour day, peasants should get the land, there should be a rise in civil liberties, but the reality is this backward society would become a capitalist society, there would be a parliament, the socialists would become the opposition in the parliament. And that was shared ground between the Bolsheviks and the, Mensche uh, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. So actually when the workers and peasants said, haven't we done enough? To some extent, they actually, the echo came back from their socialist leaderships. Yes, yeah, we're, we're sort of there. We've, we've reached, to some extent, the, the ground that we've all, all, always been on. And that was ex exacerbated by the enormous unevenness inside the class. There was at the far left of the class, uh, of the, working, of the working class. There were sections of the metal workers in the suburb of Weiborg in Petersburg who were absolutely clear that capitalism had to go. They were well in advance of 150 million other people a, a, across Russia. They were in advance of their own party, the Bolsheviks. They were in advance, of, in advance of, of, of its leadership. But beyond that, there was enormous differences. While some workers were beginning to grapple with big political questions in St. Petersburg, Moscow was a little bit further behind. The industrial centres a bit further behind, the countryside 300, 400 years behind, where the peasants were for the first time even getting a sense that actually the world can be different from what their forebears had, had experienced. There were differences between the Soviets, which still had a little bit of a time lag in the way they were elected, and the factory committees, which were directly representing the will of the workers in the workplaces. There were differences between the workers and the peasants. There were difference differences across nation nationalities. And what that meant was that while a tiny minority at the beginning of March said the Soviets should take the power, the Soviets should become the government, they were completely isolated. And this is why Leon Trotsky, one of the great leaders of the revolution, talked about the, the need for successive approximation, the need for, for workers to actually discover through their own experience how to, what tools they need in order to construct a new society. Because initially they thought they had enough. They had a Soviet that would discipline the provisional government, and that would be enough to stop the war, to bring, uh, bring bread and bring land. But sometimes it's not like that, because when you're building the IKEA wardrobe, you pick up the, the screwdriver and realise you've got a straight-edge screwdriver when you really need a Phillips. And that means you have to go away and go down to Bunnings and buy a new screwdriver and come back. And the process actually takes time and it takes a, lear and, and it, it, it takes a learning. So what Trotsky argued was, is that the workers and the peasants had to learn for themselves what the Bolsheviks were saying. Preaching at the working class by itself was not going to shift the situation. People had to find that the tools they had to hand actually didn't do the job. Um, and that's where Lenin played a, a phenomenally important role. He came back from exile in April and he did two things which absolutely transformed the course of uh, Russian history and world history at that point. The first one he said is, the Bolsheviks are wrong and he was the leader of the Bolsheviks. Actually, capitalist society and parliamentary democracy is not what we're wanting. We actually have the capability of going further, of building on the working class struggle that's already broken out. 
we can actually build a socialist society on one condition, of course, that we have two conditions. One is that we have the support of the peasants behind us because the workers are minority. And secondly, the revolution has to spread. And it will spread because by 1917, tens and hundreds of millions of people across the world were sick of war and sick of, sick of privation uh, and, and ripe uh, for, for mutiny, revolt and, 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 and revolution. So firstly, Lenin rearmed the party. He actually said, and it took him a couple of weeks of arguing with his party members, many of whom thought he was crazy. He, re he, he won the argument that, it, no, it's, we don't stop here, we go on. We actually convinced the workers that, that they need to fight. But secondly, he did something which on the face of it seems the opposite. He said, okay, now, slow down. Actually, people aren't re aren't, don't accept our message, or only small minorities accept our message. We need to patiently explain. The job of a revolutionary in April 1917 was not predominantly to prepare the revolution in a practical sense. It was not to go out onto the streets and throw rocks or build barricades. It was to convince fellow workers, fellow soldiers, sailors and peasants that if they wanted peace and if they wanted bread and they wanted land, they had to take the power into their own, uh, into their own hands. He said, we are not charlatans. We must base ourselves only upon the consciousness of the masses even if it is necessary to remain in a minority, so be it. And really the story of, 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 of 1917 from April through to October is exactly that process of successive approximation of workers and peasants and soldiers and sailors trying to get what they wanted with one, one mechanism, hitting a brick wall, retreating and then trying again. And the Bolsheviks all the time saying, you take the power, the Soviets take the power, don't rely on other people, don't rely on the capitalists, don't rely on bourgeois democracy, you rely on yourselves. Actually the power should be in the hands of the Soviets because the Soviets represent the vast majority of, of the poor and the oppressed in this, in, this, in this society. And workers did begin to learn. In April they discovered that uh, the government was absolutely adamant about uh, maintaining the war, in fact, they were absolutely adamant, not just about maintaining the war, but conquering new territories, including Istanbul, in which case our Turkish comrade might be speaking Russian to us uh, in, in, the, in the sessions uh, here, here today. And they went, no, no, no. They came out into the streets and said, no, that's, that's not what we want. We don't want a war uh, uh, like that. And then in June, they came out again because it was clear that the capitalists and the, the very moderate socialists who were running the... Uh, the, the um, the, uh, the, the Soviets were content to go along with the war. They wanted to make up nice to England and France and America and be part of the, you know, the, the, big, the big boys gang. And in June, again, uh, the Bolsheviks played a role in bringing the workers out onto the, and the soldiers out onto the streets of Petrograd. And there was a, a demonstration called against the aims of the, the Bolsheviks in uh, Petrograd in, uh, in, in June. And the Bolsheviks said, no, no, no. We're calling the people out into the streets. We will make this our demonstration. And one newspaper said, judging by the placards and slogan, slogans of the demonstrators, the Sunday demonstration revealed the complete triumph of Bolshevism amongst the Petersburg so uh, proletariat. And at that point, the Bolsheviks won a majority in the Petrograd factory committees. And the factory committees were closest to the heart, the hearts and minds of the working class. And then in July, uh, the, the revolution receives a setback because the workers in Petersburg go too far too fast. They actually think the Bolsheviks are selling out. They boo the Bolsheviks. Some of them tear up their party cards because they can't take it anymore and they want to seize the power there and then for the Soviets in Petersburg, so, uh, Petrograd. And the, and the Bolsheviks said, in the spirit of patiently explain, we understand, we're with you, but not yet. Wait for the rest of the country to, to catch up. Wait for that unevenness across Russia to even itself out. Wait for, you know, for us to be surrounded by support when we, when we take that. And there was repression, and uh, the Bolsheviks were, were brutally repressed, and a lot of workers went away and went, hang on, they were right, they were right. And slowly the working class begins to re-emerge in, in August, and there's a fantastic moment where all the capitalists and the um, and the, and the uh, moderate, moderate socialists come to Moscow for a conference and the Bolsheviks through their, through the, uh, through their local organisations <coughs> called a strike and there were no lights, no tram cars, the factories and shops were closed and the railway yards and, and stations, even the workers in the restaurants had gone on strike. And this is really the other part of the story of 1917 that at every point as the old order tried to reassert itself,
as the generals tried to get the, the soldiers to salute and follow orders, let alone run at the enemy and fight, as the bosses tried to get back control of the workplaces, as the ministers tried to establish uh, normality, they ran into the implacable hostility, not of the Bolsheviks, but of tens, in fact, many, many tens of millions of workers and peasants who said there is no going back. We're not sure of the way forward, but we are sure we are not going back to, to, uh, to the old days. And the peasant war in the countryside intensified. You know, August, September, and into October, the peasants were seizing the land in ever, la ever larger numbers. They were shooting the landlords uh, who tried to resist or taking over the property of the landlords who ran away. Uh, the workers were more and more determined. And I think this is, is what gives the lie to the idea that this was a coup. The final moment of transferring power from the provisional government to the Soviets was a very small thing indeed. In fact, it was smaller than the Fermi Revolution, which is seen in many quarters, in, even today amongst respectable people, as a good revolution, because it over, overthrew the Tsar and opened the way to parliamentary democracy. The final overthrow of the provisional government was just a couple of thousand people storming the Winter Palace, which basically had no one defending it, going up and finding the provisional government sitting in a room. And I remember I've actually been to that room. It's, it's still preserved in the Winter Palace. They were sitting around the table, completely helpless, and they were led away. And that was it. It didn't take very much, and that's one of the reasons it can be described as a coup. But that final moment where the power transferred officially from the provisional government to the state government was built on the mass struggles of tens of millions of people, preceding February, of course, but in particular from February through to October, an intensification and people beginning to say, the Bolsheviks are right, we have, to, we have to act. See, even in July, there is a famous incident, which is quoted in a number of different books, of, uh, I think it's a soldier, shaking his fist at a, uh, a, a moderate uh, government, a moderate socialist uh, in, on the Soviet, saying, take power when it's given to you, you bastard. And you think to yourself, there's something actually philosophically wrong with that sentence. Because, firstly, the, the, um, the moderate socialists did not want power. In fact, actually, he was trying to give it to the capitalists as quickly as possible. But secondly, it meant that the soldier, the apocryphal soldier, and the soldiers and sailors and workers around him hadn't yet quite worked out. They couldn't rely on those moderate socialists. They could rely on the Bolsheviks, and they could rely on themselves. And in October, that balance shifted. Um, I'm going to spend the last <coughs> three or four minutes just dealing with uh, a second question, and uh, I think I've run out of time, so um, I'll deal with it very briefly and, and hope it gets taken up in the discussion. And that's the question of, could this have happened without a Bolshevik party? Could this have happened without Lenin? And the truth of the matter is the Bolsheviks were actually pretty slow and pretty flabby at the beginning of the year. Um, when the revolt broke out, uh, they actually argued against people going on strike on International Women's Day. When it happened, they didn't get a leaflet organised until pretty much it was all over. And, and the party leadership in Petrograd, sounds familiar, does it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the party leadership in Petrograd, actually five days in, was considering putting out a leaflet saying, OK, everybody, <coughs> we've probably gone far enough, back to work. But let's, and thankfully, they didn't get their shit together and the revolution succeeded before the, the Bolsheviks <laughs> could try and call, call it off. And worse than that, the Bolshevik leadership um, uh, that coalesced quite quickly after that revolution uh, was um, said, that's it, okay, we've gone far enough. In fact, actually, the old differences between us and the Mensheviks, they're over, we should all get together. Stalin, by the way, was uh, very, very, uh, very much of, uh, uh, of the kind of prosecuting that argument until Lenin comes along and says, no, we are going forward to work, work, work as revolution. And that's where the difference between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks on paper, on many policies, there was no difference. But the fundamental difference was the Mensheviks believed that the capitalists had to make the capitalist revolution supported by the workers, and that that was the limit of what was possible. The Bolsheviks had always argued, even when they were wrong about the capitalists taking the power, that the workers had to lead the fight. And because they had built up nuclei and party branches and so on inside the main industrial centres, in particular in Petrograd, where the workers knew they had to take the lead. When Lenin said, take the lead and take it further and take it to power, that made sense to the Bolshevik workers in a way it couldn't make sense to the supporters of the Mensheviks. And what seemed like bizarre and sometimes sort of, you know, uh, uh, bizarre differences between the two parties actually suddenly stood in stark relief. It was the difference between a fight for power and a fight to give power, fight to give power away. 
And the Bolsheviks from April onwards, <coughs> thanks to Lenin's involvement, actually then play a critical role, bringing the masses onto the streets, restraining the masses to the best they could in July, leading the defense of the revolution against an attempted military coup in August, and then preparing the insurrection. But even then, even then, sections of the Bolshevik leadership were conservative and cautious and worried that the insurrection was a mistake or the, or the insurrection would, would, would be defeated. In fact, two of them scabbed. They not only voted against the insurrection on the Central Committee, they went to the bourgeois media and actually presented an outline of their dissent, which, by the way, gives the lie to the fact that the, the, the insurrection was organised behind people's backs. Everybody was talking about it. It was trending on Twitter, trust me, in, 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 uh, in, in 1917. But again, Lenin, and of course there were others in the leadership, like Trotsky and others, turned to the mass of the, of, of the Bolshevik workers. And the Bolsheviks, by this stage, had gone from 10,000 members in February to 250,000 members in October. And beyond them stood millions of people listening to and, and, and following the Bolsheviks. And uh, Lenin carried the argument. And the result is that on October the 25th, the pimple on the bum of, uh, of Russian society, the provisional government, was burst and power was taken by the All-Russian Congress of Soviets that, that met that day. And the Bolsheviks, initially in coalition with a, a peasant-based party, formed the national government. And, Len and Lenin declared that we will now proceed to build the socialist order. And I want to conclude with this one last thought, because I know I really am out of time now. This is uh, from Rosa Luxemburg. Rosa Luxemburg was a Polish-German revolutionary who, in many ways, could have and should have played the role of Lenin in the German Revolution. Uh, which was tragically brought to an end uh, and she was murdered um, and her body thrown into a canal in Berlin. But obviously before, before that happened she was trying to touch, make sense of what had happened in Russia because what happened in Russia was a shock, uh, a worry to some and an excitement to other all across the socialist movement. And she concludes her little pamphlet on the Russian Revolution with this. Lenin and Trotsky and their friends were the first those who went ahead as an example to the proletariat of the world. This is the essential and enduring in Bolshevik policy. In this sense, theirs is the immortal historical service of having marched at the head of the international proletariat with the conquest of political power and the practical placing of the problem of the realization of socialism and of having advanced mightily the settlement of the score between capital and labor in, entire, in the entire world. In Russia, backward Russia, the problem could only be posed, it could not be solved. And, um, and in this sense, the future everywhere belongs to Bolshevism. Our past, our future, in Russia, in Australia.